open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And if you're, if you're without a Bible this morning, don't let that bother you at all. We do want you to be able to follow us as we go through it. So behind your section, there are some tray tables with Bibles on them. Please feel free to go ahead and get up now and grab one of those and, and keep it as well. You can keep it. That's our gift to you this morning. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Let me read that for us, and then after that, we'll, we'll see, see what else God wants to do this morning. Now, while staying with them, he, that is Jesus, ordered them, his disciples, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now pause for a moment. Isn't it interesting? There, there's always that concern in our heart. Jesus is, is now when we get to use you to establish our kingdom. Will you now restore the kingdom to the United States? Will you, that's, Jesus is going to clarify his mission here. Let's continue. Verse 7. He said to them, it's, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's not how you're going to get your power, so to speak. You will have power, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. That word witnesses in the original Greek is the same word from which we get the word martyr. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. You'll have power even unto death to stand as my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray really quickly and ask the Lord to keep our hearts and our minds open to what he wants to say this morning. Heavenly Father, help us as we look into your word and study it. Come and help us and let your Holy Spirit come in power. We're going to read about that here, but, but let that happen for us, that the Holy Spirit would come in power to do whatever it is you desire to do in our hearts this morning. We ask that in your name, Jesus, and everybody said, amen. You know the saying, knowledge is power. That's not exactly true, is it, all the time? For instance, I'm sure you'll agree with me that there is a big difference between knowing what you should do and actually having the power to carry it out. Any Christians in the room? There's a big difference between knowing what we should do and actually having the power to carry it out. Uh, and, and what we're going to do now is, is we continue our series called The Drama of Redemption, We'll remember last week how Jesus made it clear for his disciples what they were supposed to do when he gave them the Great Commission. Well, now, this week, we're going to see that Jesus not only informed his disciples concerning what to do, but he actually empowered them for that mission. And we're, we're just going to read Acts chapter 2 to see how he did that. So we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 1, and go all the way to verse 41, but we'll break it up into pieces and we'll read a little bit and talk a little bit and explain what's going on. So let's do that starting in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Now when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire so not necessarily fire, but divided tongues as of fire, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And typically when you read this passage, that is what gets all the emphasis. Tongues, right? Speaking in tongues. And even now, we're probably getting all these questions about speaking in tongues what it does mean, what it doesn't mean, what it looks like, what it doesn't look like. But let's just keep reading the Bible and see where it directs our attention. Verse 5. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them 
speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, aren't, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Well, how is it then that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So just for modern terms, geographically, we're talking about Europe, Asia Minor, Northern Africa. Verse 12, here's where the passage directs our attention. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Verse 13, but some mocking said they are just filled with new wine. From this point on, believe it or not, the Apostle Peter is going to stand up representing the believers, the newly born church, and he's going to give a sermon based on a text from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And Peter has basically a one-point message with some application, a one-point message. And you know what his point is? His point, the point of his message is going to be the point of my message this morning, at least the first point of my message, and here's what it is. If you want to know what Pentecost means, it is simply this. Jesus, the one that you crucified, Jesus has been raised by God and exalted to the highest seat of power in the universe at God's right hand. Jesus, the one you crucified, has been exalted by God and now sits at the highest seat of power in the universe. Now let's see how Peter gets us there, beginning in verse 14. Peter hears those who are mocking. He sees those who are confused. And in verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. You know, when the world is confused and when others are mocking the things of God's Spirit somebody's got to stand up and lift their voice and begin to speak truth into that situation. It's exactly what Peter does. And he says, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day or about nine o'clock, which I've always laughed at that. Like, is what does he mean? Like, if you came back later, maybe, you know, if you gave him more time? No, no. This is, no, he says, it's only the third hour. They, you know, no, that, that's a bit of humor. But, but I, I, let me mention this. I will say this. Hopefully, there's never a time during the day where it's characteristic of any believer or any church that when people encounter us, they would see drunkenness uh, in our midst, all right? That would not be a laughing matter. But Peter says it's, it's barely 9 o'clock. That can't be the reason. So what is the reason? Peter begins to explain. Verse 16. This, what you're observing, is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And then he launches off from memory, I suppose. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. And in the last days it shall be that God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass. Peter bookends this section. He carefully chooses, or chooses rather, this section of Joel to say at the beginning, God is pouring out his spirit, and right here at the end, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter says something is happening. It was told to us in the prophet Joel. The Spirit of God is being poured out. 
and, and it's leading us somewhere to the point where people are going to call upon the Lord and be saved. Perhaps even some people here this morning. Yes, Peter says, what you're witnessing is the result of something that has been poured out, but not, not wine that these people have poured out for themselves this morning. The Spirit of God poured out from heaven by Jesus Christ. And Peter, Peter continues, and he begins to explain this text from Joel. And this is what he says in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. And he, uh, that was his audience. I, I want to say this morning, men and women of Richmond, Virginia, hear Peter's words. Hear God's words through Peter. Everything that you're witnessing is about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. A number of things in that paragraph I want to I point out very quickly. Verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed. I want you to see very quickly, and hopefully some of you have a chance this summer on Wednesday nights to join us for our summer dinner series. I have, to, I have to really say that slowly so that I don't call it the dumber sinner series, which is, it always wants to come out that way. But hopefully you can join us for our summer dinner series. And some of you maybe are going to take that track that we're calling the doctrines of grace. And one of the things we're looking at there is the tension that Christians often feel between what happens as a result of God's sovereignty or Him predestining something? And, and what happens as the result of us choosing something and being responsible for those choices? If you look at verse 23, there's a, there's a really good merging of those two things. And, and, and here's how it sounds. This Jesus, speaking of the cross, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So in other words, everything that happened to Jesus leading up to his crucifixion, as horrific as that was, was all done and is the result of God's full sovereignty over the matter. Not only did God have foreknowledge of it, meaning he knew it would happen in the future, that, that foreknowledge was more than that. Further, it was part of God's plan. He planned it. It's very important to understand. God planned it, and so it, it is the result of God's sovereignty from beginning to end, and yet, and yet, it is equally true in a biblical sense what you see in the rest of verse 23. Not only is this because of God's definite plan and foreknowledge, but human beings who sinned are still fully responsible for what happened to Jesus. Do you see that? Verse 23, yes, this is according to God's definite plan and foreknowledge, but you crucified and killed him. And for that, God rightly holds us responsible and accountable. Does everybody see that? These two things in the Bible are never at odds when you take the Bible in context. So join us for our summer dinner series, and hopefully you'll get to hear and learn a lot more about that as you listen to some of the teachers in the church. All right, so let's pick back up in, in verse 25. David says something, and Peter just continues to reel off Scripture after Scripture. David says concerning him, speaking of Jesus. He wasn't speaking about himself, and now Peter begins to quote Psalm chapter 16, verse 8 through 11. When David wrote that, he wasn't speaking about himself in this part, where he says, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. He's speaking in the first person, and so you would naturally think David must be talking about David. But as he continues, verse 26, Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Now is David still talking about himself? You still think he's talking about himself? No, this, like many places in the Scripture, it's all pointing us to Jesus Christ. 
And, da- and David actually gets around to saying that, and Peter will explain it. Verse 28, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And then Peter explains. Now, brothers, listen. I can say quite confidently about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Couldn't be talking about himself in some of the things that he said here. So he goes on in verse 30 and says, Now, being therefore a prophet, however, and knowing that God had sworn all the way back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 with an oath to David that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. That's what Psalm 16 verses 8 through 11 is all about. It's about Jesus. David spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades or the grave, that he did not see corruption in his flesh. And and then Peter goes on and he says, here's my point, this Jesus, this Jesus spoken of in this scripture, this Jesus of the Bible, God raised up. And of that, we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted, here's, here's his point now, Jesus has been raised and exalted to the highest place of power in the universe. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens. And what David says in Psalm chapter 110 verse 1 is not something that he himself was privy to. He didn't ascend to heaven to hear this conversation. And yet, David was able to say a thousand years before Christ appears, the Lord said to my Lord, verse 34, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now see, that was speaking of Christ. God looks at his son and says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Christ is seated. And no matter what happens in the earth today, no matter how much it makes us panic, Jesus is not panicking. We have to get this as people. I mean, every four years, I have to watch the Christian church panic because of the election results. Every so often, someone converts to Islam, and i got to watch the church panic. Every so often, something happens, and we're all wondering, oh, how's it going to turn out? God did not raise from the dead a panicking Jesus Christ. He is in heaven at the right hand of God, this Jesus that is confident in what will happen in the future because he has poured out his spirit upon the church is still seated at the right hand of the Father. Nothing can move him and nothing can overcome him. It was impossible for death itself to keep him down. Jesus has conquered all and nothing in all of history past, present, or future, will ever change that. This Jesus, God raised up. And there is something that God wants the world to know now because of that, and it's right here in verse 36. Let all the house of Israel... Here's Peter's... You got his point. Jesus is raised to the right hand of the Father. Here's his application. It's coming up. He wants you to know something, and then he wants you to do something. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let all the house of Israel, and I want to say today, let all of Richmond, Virginia, let all of the United States, let all of the world know that this, know this and know it for certain. Jesus has been raised by God. God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus we have crucified. So here's, here's some good news. You don't ever have to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Because God already took care of that. God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. You don't, you don't ever have to make him anything. You, just, you have to receive Christ. Receive him as God gives him to you. As Lord and Savior. Lord and Master. Lord and Christ. True story, I was in UCLA, this is on the campus of UCLA back in 2004, Uh, and God wants us to know things like this for certain, and that's very difficult, isn't it, in an age of skepticism. 
People are always telling us, well, you can't really know anything for certain. You should doubt everything. It's, it, it, doubting is almost a virtue nowadays, right? It, it, it's just you should never take anything at face value. Doubt everything. Of course, accept your doubts. Be certain about those, right? You, you, somebody got it. But I was on the campus of UCLA back in the spring semester of 2004, and, and I was just out there for a, a training program for up-and-coming college ministers. And as a former athlete, I decided, you know, let me walk around for a couple of hours and try to talk to some athletes about Christ. And I was, I was very intimidated. I mean, it's easy for me to be bold here, but I'm just like you. When I'm out there and I have to talk to people who are not excited about what I'm saying, it's very difficult. Right? Especially when they're as big as these UCLA football players. So they're coming out of the, out of the building and I'm just letting them pass. I'm like, ah, that's a, that's a lineman. He's much too big. If he, doesn't, if he doesn't like what I say, there's no telling how this is going to go. Uh, but I, I just began to pray and I'm like, Lord, help, help me. Give me boldness. I mean, help me not to be intimidated uh, to speak to these young men, but, but help me just to, just to serve as a witness for Christ here. Who knows? Maybe somebody will listen and it will make a difference. And so one by one, they started to come out. I think all the linemen were gone, and I was down to the wide receivers. And I, I thought, okay, here we go. Here we go. We, 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 can, we can step in there now. And, and this wide receiver named Riley came out with a long snapper named Edward. And, I, and we just started to talk. And very quickly, I, I said, Riley, tell me something. Is, is there anything that we can know for certain in this life? And he, he knew where I was going with this. So he quickly said, no, I, I don't think so. I said, Riley, do you know that for certain? He paused and he laughed and he said, I, I guess I can't know that for certain if we can't know anything for certain. And, and so I said, well, all right, if you, if you can't know that for certain, then does that mean then that you're open to the possibility that there are some things we can know for certain? He said, well, I guess I, guess I would have to be. Great, Riley. Are there some things about God that we can know for certain? Well, I suppose I have to be open to that. What about Jesus? Are there some things about Jesus we can know for certain? Edward is laughing by this point. I mean, he's having a good time with this. He, he didn't know I was coming to him next, right? But here it is. And so eventually, is there anything about Jesus we can know for certain? And Riley says, I guess so. And I said, Riley, look, here, let me just show you something in the Bible real quick. And we opened up to Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Let me show you one thing God wants you and everyone else to know for certain. Edward, come here. Come close. Know for certain that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. I have no idea what happened to Edward and Riley. Edward appeared to become a believer at that point, but then I could tell after a few weeks, it just didn't seem to stick, right? So who knows where he is now, but, but we prayed for them in the first service, and I'm, I'm trusting that the Lord has brought both of them to faith by this time, or he will do it very soon. But I, I just, maybe you're here this morning, and you're like Edward O'Reilly, and you wouldn't call yourself or consider yourself a Christian but just something in reading Acts chapter 2 and hearing about Jesus, something's happening in your heart. And you're, you're starting to realize the relationship between me and God is not what it's supposed to be. It's not right. And you're, you're feeling that reality, and it's actually making a difference to you right now. It's bothering you. And you're starting to desire that that would be fixed, that it would be changed, so that the relationship would be right. You know that your sin is what has separated you from God. You understand that in your heart. And, and you're starting to even be convinced that the only way for that to be fixed is by what Jesus has done in dying on the cross, being raised by God from the dead, and now offering forgiveness and his Holy Spirit. And, and, and what I want to do is just encourage you. If that's you, then stick with us not only through the rest of this message, but please consider that what is happening to you is what Peter mentions here in this next paragraph as he continues. Let's look at verse 37. There were some people there that day feeling just like that. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. One of our members, Drew Coles, helped me in between services, and he said, I, when I read this, I appreciate the precision of God. He knows how to cut to the heart without ripping the heart to shreds. Look, he, he knows 
how to get there. He, nobody is better with this gospel scalpel. He just cuts to the heart just enough for you to feel your need and for him to be able to fill you with his spirit. He cuts to the heart. And they said to Peter, what do we do? Their question has gone from what does all this mean? And they understand now. They have clarity. And now their question is, what do we do? And so Peter moves ahead with his application. And he says, it's very simple. Let me break it down for you real smooth. Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. If you're here this morning and you're, you're the one sitting there and your heart's beating kind of fast, your palms are sweating, and it's because you know things aren't right between you and God, would you please consider this morning that this is happening to you right now by the Holy Spirit? God, the Lord our God, is calling you to himself. And would you trust Christ and give him your life? That's, that's, this is the first thing the miracle of Pentecost means. I don't want the speaking in tongues to steal the airtime. This is about us knowing for certain that we know exactly where the body of Christ is today. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, at the highest place of power and authority in the universe. And from that place, he has poured out his spirit on human beings, and now the gospel is going out through those messengers. And through them, God is calling people just like you to himself today. Will you receive Christ? There's something else that the miracle of Pentecost means. The second thing that I, I want to mention, and it's from earlier parts of the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, but the second thing that the miracle of Pentecost means is that there is no substitute for the power of the Holy Spirit if we want to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm going to say that again. There is no substitute for the power of the Holy Spirit if you and I are going to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ in this world. And I, and I mention that because, I'll just be honest, my, my heart really bothers me and feels grieved at times. I feel like we just know too well today. We, just, we, we have a plan. We... We've got a program. We just know how to start churches, and we know how to grow churches, and we, we put on conferences about it, and we write books about it, and, and it's all so smooth. It's like just add water. Do this. Here's what you do at your informational meeting. Here's what you do. You launch this. You, you grow that. You, you hire this. You, you know, I just... I, all of those things may happen in a church that is fully dependent upon God's Spirit, but I, all I can tell you is at times I feel it. Like what's happened to us as the church? Do we really feel like we can just operate with organizational business methods and, and, and grow the church and accomplish eternal results? There's no, there's no substitute for the power of the Holy Spirit, our dependence upon the Spirit. I want to show you very quickly in the Bible here is a description of the early believers, Jesus' followers, leading up to the day of Pentecost, just, just describing them in places like Luke chapter 24. Why don't you turn there? The same guy who wrote the book of Acts wrote the gospel of Luke, and at the end of that volume, he has some things to say about the church and what marked them in those days leading up to Pentecost. Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and 45, first of all, these early disciples had the best Bible teaching available to mankind. We appreciate that some of you have said you appreciate the Bible teaching here at Redemption Hill Church. We are under no illusion that we offer you the same kind of Bible teaching that these guys got right here in these two verses. Listen to this. This is Jesus teaching them. And Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Jesus himself goes through the law, 
the prophets, the Psalms, and everything, and shows how it all points to him. It opens their minds supernaturally to understand the scriptures. Bible teaching, they had it. Check. Not only did they have the best Bible teaching available to mankind, they were a worshiping church. Look at verse 52 of Luke 24. They worshiped Jesus and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were a worshiping church filled with Bible knowledge, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. More than that, verse 53, they were continually in the temple blessing God. They gathered together as Christian community. They were filled with the grace of God, appreciating and celebrating it, worshiping Jesus, knowing the scriptures. And they were, Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. They were also a church given to prayer. They devoted themselves, the Bible says there. They were with one accord, devoting themselves to prayer. Corporate prayer was happening Check, 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 Bible teaching, worshiping, praying, community, together, everything checks off. This group has all the makings and markings of what you would consider to be a viable, effective church. And Jesus says to them, wait. Wait until you are clothed with power from on high. They were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You can see that for yourself in John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus breathes upon them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, and they did. And he says, wait until you're clothed with power from on high. There's a special power to which Jesus is referring. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, he identifies it as being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we see how that plays out on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now, let me quickly tell you what that does not mean for all you nervous folks out there. That does not mean that every believer today and every single church has to wait to be baptized or clothed with this kind of power. I I hope you'll appreciate what's happening here in Acts chapter 2. It's an historically unique situation that these disciples find themselves in. Remember, Jesus has just been raised, he has just been exalted to the right hand, and up until this point in history, the Holy Spirit has not been poured out on the church at all in this way. Jesus took care of that from heaven. He poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in this day, and now what we understand as we go through the rest of the Bible, you've got to keep it all in context, When we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, and the Apostle Paul is used by Jesus to address this matter in terms of how it works today, he tells us that we were all baptized with one spirit into one body. So when you and I come now into the body of Christ through faith in Christ, we are baptized into the body of Christ with the Holy Spirit. And so that continual fountain or flow of the Holy Spirit baptizing the church is there, and as you're brought into the church, you're baptized into the church in that sense as well. But, but that does not do away with this. Now, I, I, hope, I hope your heart is open to what I'm about to say. There is a special kind of power in the Holy Spirit that leads to boldness in the lives of believers like us. And what I observe in the scriptures and in my own life is that it is possible for that boldness to wane or decrease significantly. When I look back at my own life, 16 years now walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, for the most part, when I look back on those earliest days of walking with Christ, I am extremely happy with the progress Christ has made in my life in terms of sanctification sanctification, man, I'm having trouble this morning, but in terms of sanctification and the growth in in, in maturity, walking with Christ as a Christian, I'm, I'm glad to see the progress God has made in my life. I would say just like all of you, I've got a long way to go in a lot of areas, but I can see real progress. 
The one exception to that, the one thing that I look back upon, I look at the earliest days of walking with Christ and I say, I wish I could go back to that. The one thing like that is my boldness as a witness. You, you probably are deluded into thinking that I'm always as bold as I am right now. Not even close. I'm just like you at times. When I, when I find myself in front of my next door neighbor or in front of a relative and I know intuitively everything is on the line, I feel a desire to share Christ with this person. But if I do, I feel the possibility of this person distancing themselves from me and me being cut off from them. And I, I feel it. I feel the reality that my next door neighbor may begin to hide from me if I take this step of boldness to share Christ. And most of the time, I say to my shame, most of the time, I just can't cross that line. I need power. There's a big difference between knowing what I'm supposed to do and having the power to do it. I need power. I need boldness in that moment. And, and what I've learned over the years is that this boldness is situational. It can be there at one moment and it can be gone the next. My fear for us at times as a Christian church is, is I think a lot of times as a whole now, there are always the Mike Newbergers and, and, and that kind of thing, but as a whole, I feel like we're marked as people a lot by the lack of boldness more than we are by the presence of it. And that has very real implications for those who need Christ the most. So how does this boldness come? Look with me really quickly at Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 29, that the apostles are gathered here, the, the, the believers are gathered, and they're praying together. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, we, we get to see them receiving boldness here. They pray, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like. I just know that a number of years ago, uh, we, were, we were all praying somewhere before we bought that building, and, and an, earthquake <laughs> an earthquake happened. You all remember that earthquake? Well, we, for a minute, I think we thought it was our prayer session, but it was... We, we, lo and behold, we found out that there was something happening under the earth. But I don't know exactly what happened here, but the place where they were was shaken, and watch the result. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. Do you, you know what happened here? Those who were baptized with the Holy Spirit on this day in Pentecost, they recognized that as they continued to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and desired to be used by him in the world as effective witnesses, that they had a continual need for a filling of the Holy Spirit that led to continued boldness. That, that's what I'm missing at times. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know, to be honest, I find that that does not come while I'm playing video games like Temple Run or watching the... 10 o'clock news, I, I don't find myself being filled with the Spirit by many of those things. I, I do find myself getting closest to that when I'm immersed in the Word of God. When I'm consistent in my gathering with other believers, when I'm praying to God, if, if I'm watching the news instead of just taking it all in, when I'm using it as a way to pray to the Lord, I find myself, I find myself closer to being filled with the Spirit. And, and it's interesting, I, I noticed that at, at that point, it seems to come out of me more naturally, these conversations where Christ is brought up. I don't know if you've noticed that as well, but, but my prayer for us this morning is that we would be characterized as a church, whatever's keeping us from it now, that we would be characterized as a group of people that are filled with the Holy Spirit unto boldness. 
not, not unto being obnoxious, but unto boldness, where we have the courage to speak about Christ when the door of opportunity is opened. Courage at the moment where we tend to shrink back, as I so often do. And I'll, I'll leave you with this this morning. Just to review I, I, the, the meaning of Pentecost, what, what is this miracle all about? Well, number one, it's about the fact that Jesus has been exalted and is seated at the right hand of God. And it also reminds us that there's no effective substitute for the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. Mark chapter 4 will tell us you, you just can't have a program. The sower sows the word, goes to sleep, and all by itself it grows. He doesn't know how. There's things about church planting and church growth that we don't understand. We don't know how. But all by itself, the Lord's Spirit begins to do it. But I, I want to leave this, especially if you're, if you're here and you're not a believer in Christ this morning. I, I want to encourage you that this Jesus, which has all authority and all power, is using his place of authority to open a door of opportunity and welcome to you. He grants to you an opportunity to be forgiven of all of your sins. Please do not discount yourself. Don't disqualify yourself on the grounds that you think you've been too bad. We all have messed up lives to one degree or another. That has never stopped Jesus from saving anyone. In fact, you're the, you're the person who's a candidate for his grace. If you understand that, you're, you're probably in a good place to be a candidate for his grace. And, 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 and there's, there's this thing that you have to do, though. Peter, that's why Peter, I think, he didn't want to be mean, but Peter was very honest with people listening to him. This Jesus whom you crucified, your sins, my sins, even in this room tonight, to this morning, your sins play a part in the guilt that put Christ on the cross. And you have to openly acknowledge that guilt. Romans 4.25 will tell us, Jesus was delivered up for our sins. But if you claim your share in the guilt of the cross, you can then in the next moment claim your share in its gift of forgiveness and eternal life. And, and John Newton, the author, the guy who wrote the song Amazing Grace that we all seem to know so well, John Newton wrote another song that I think really captures the heart of what Jesus wants to happen when we look at him, crucified for our sins and now exalted to the right hand of God, feeling first the guilt and then also sensing the gift of forgiveness. John Newton said, I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood who fixed his loving eyes on me as near his cross I stood and never till my dying breath will I forget that look which seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair, for I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. But with a second look, he said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for your ransom paid. I died that you might live. Christ offers you forgiveness, full pardon, the gift of the Holy Spirit, eternal life and joy in his presence forever. Please receive him today as Lord and Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, seal these things in our hearts. I pray that I, I, I represented you faithfully this morning. If there was anything I said that needs to be forgotten, I pray that you would perform another miracle here and, and just do that. But anything that should remain, Lord, I pray that you would cause it to remain in our hearts, to take root, and to produce the kind of life that you desire and that you deserve. May it be that thousands upon thousands upon thousands will continue to experience the miracle of Pentecost. Let all have a chance to hear the gospel in their own language. And when they do, call them to yourself. Call even now people to yourself that they too may come in repentance and faith and receive the gift that Christ offers, forgiveness and eternal life. We ask that in his name now. And everybody said, amen.